Hello everyone, this is Bilal speaking. I'm a clinical application specialist working for Hamilton Medical. Throughout this video, we are going to have a look uh, at some of the facts that have been noticed lately in patients with COVID-19 induced ARDS. And specifically, we are going to um, have a look at some uh, of the facts that um, makes the COVID-19 induced ARDS to be described as atypical, things that are not usually seen in patients with ARDS. So starting with the first observation that have been noticed by Gattinoni and his colleagues, they have noticed that almost half of those patients, they may present with severe hypoxemia that is associated with nearly normal respiratory system compliance. So if we look at this graph down here, uh, we have almost half of those patients with a respiratory system compliance of 50 or more, which is something that is not usually seen in patients with ARDS. The second observation that have been noticed by Gattinoni and his colleagues is that even those patients share the same etiology, yet they might present with a quite variable characteristics. So you might have those patients who are uh, hypoxic, but normally breathing. Um, you might have those patients who are remarkably dyspneic. You might have those patients who are deeply hypocabinic, those who are normocabinic, and those who are hypercabinic. You might have those patients who are quite responsive to nitric oxide, and those who are not. And you might have those patients who are responsive to prone positioning, and those who are not. If we look at this graph here, it represents a patient's case. Um, he has been hospitalized in Italy. If we look at his CT scan on admission, as we can see, the vast majority of the lung tissue apparently well aerated. And this is also in line uh, with the Hounsfield units distribution as we can see on this graph here. Actually, if we want to understand this graph, we need to understand the meaning of Hounsfield units. Simply, Hounsfield unit um, is a measurement that uh, is used to describe the density of tissues in relation to the density of water. So considering the density of water as a reference point, um, the more than negative units that we have, this means uh, the less density that we have in relation to water. And this kind of uh, left-sided skewness, uh, this represents um, a well-aerated lung tissue, as we have seen on the CT scan. Um, yet, this patient is having a PF ratio of only 95. 95 represents a very severe form of ARDS. So how come this patient is having this well aerated lung tissue, yet he is having this severe hypoxia? Um, actually, this same patient, few days later, he, uh, he had this CT scan. As we can see down here, um, there is a, a significant uh, portion of the lung that is apparently consolidated. And we have areas of ground glass opacity up here. Uh, and we still have a small portion of the lung that um, uh, still well aerated on both sides, as we can see. Um, having this CT scan in hand, um, it is expected to have a PF ratio of 84. Um, the absurd thing is that the PF ratio did not differ that much from the beginning. So this, this patient... Um, he had this weird phenomena in the beginning. So he has um, a well aerated lung tissue along with severe hypoxemia. The only explanation for this is that there is something went wrong in the pulmonary circulation, in the pulmonary perifusion of this patient. So it is good to know about the most commonly reported CT findings in those patients. The most commonly reported finding is the ground glass opacity, which is by definition a hazy areas with slightly increased density in the lungs without obscuration of the, of the bronchial and the vascular margins. And it has been reported in the vast majority of cases. Uh, the second most common reported uh, finding is the consolidation, which is by definition an alveolar spaces that are fluid filled or filled with inflammatory cells or cellular deprives. And in certain occasions, uh, tissues other than the normal lung tissue, such as in cases of malignancies. Um, the prevalence of this finding um, uh, is quite variable. So it is somewhere between 2 up to 64% of the cases. 
The third most common finding is the reticular pattern, which is a thickened pulmonary interstitial structures such as interlobular septa and intralobular lines. And the fourth most commonly reported finding is the crazy paving pattern, which is um, a thickened interlobular septa and intralobular lines. So it is similar to the reticular pattern. However, it is superimposed on a ground glass opacity. Um, these are the most commonly reported findings. Um, however, there are some other atypical presentations uh, that are uh, that um, um, also possible to be not, uh, noticed. Um, there is also another uh, remarkable finding that is um, these findings starts at the periphery of the lungs uh, and then spreads to inside. This graph represents the frequency distribution of the CT findings over the time course of the disease. Um, the blue bars represents the ground glass opacity, the green ones represents the crazy paving pattern, and the last ones represents the consolidation. So if we look, um, the, the ground glass opacity is decreasing over the time course of the disease, while uh, the consolidation is increasing, which is something expected in an inflammatory process. Um, the crazy paving pattern is uh, peaking in the middle course of the disease and then it decreases um, in the later stages of the disease. This suggests that uh, the crazy paving pattern is transforming into another looking form um, other than the original one. Going back to the report by Gattanoni and his colleagues, they are suggesting to classify those patients into two distinct phenotypes, type H and type L. Those patients who are presenting with type H, they might present with high elastins, which uh, can be explained by a reduction in gas volume and an increased proportion of edematous lung tissue. They might have a high right to left shunt, which can be explained by that proportion of cardiac output that perifuses the non-aerated lung tissue. And they might have a high lung weight, which can be again explained by the greater proportion of edematous lung. And uh, they might have a high lung recruitability. Uh, simply, if the proportion of collapsed alveoli increases, logically, the potential for recruitability increases as well. Uh, patients with type L, they might present with low elastance, which suggests a uh, well aerated lung tissue or a preserved respiratory system compliance. Uh, they might also present with low ventilation to perifusion ratio. They might present with low lung weight. Um, actually, those patients might present with ground glass opacity, which suggests um, a minimal amount of edema. Um, they also might present with low lung recruitability. Simply, if the lungs are well aerated, then there is nothing to be recruited. Now, the question is, why those patients with type L are considered ARDS patients? Obviously, due to low PF ratio or due to the severe hypoxemia that they are uh, experiencing. So the question is, um, if their lungs are well aerated, then why they are having this severe form of, of hypoxemia? Um, logically, the only explanation is the low ventilation to perifusion ratio. So the answer is lying behind this line here. Similar results have been reported by this study, which is basically a study on uh, physiological measures that have been done on 10 patients with confirmed COVID-19 induced ARDS by using electrical impedance tomography. Uh, the authors reported um, a high inter-individual variability in terms of potential for recruitability, which is in line with the findings that have been reported by Gattanoni and his colleagues. They also reported um, a high proportion of ventilated non-perifused lung units in comparison to perifused non-ventilated units. In other words, the, 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 the contribution of ventilation to perifusion mismatch is greater than the contribution of right to left shunting in, in causing uh, hypoxemia. Uh, so uh, they um, recommended to use a bedside estimates of recruitability in order to better individualize the patient's care and to avoid complications. While I was preparing this presentation, I came across a freaking out observation uh, that has been reported in this study, uh, which says literally, mortality for those requiring mechanical ventilation was 88.1%. Now, those patients might have died due to other causes than an appropriate uh, ventilation strategy. However, still, this is a very high mortality rate, and it should uh, raise the question about the ventilation strategy that have been used with those patients.
Keeping in mind all of the aforementioned facts, Gattinoni and his group are suggesting a specific approach to ventilate those patients. So firstly, we need to correctly phenotype those patients. If our patient is type H, then we can follow the same rules for the classical ARDS. Namely, when appropriate, we can select high P, recruitment maneuvers, prone positioning, and all other measures. However, if the patient is type L, then we should start by assessing this patient as usual. If the patient is not yet dyspneic, then we can reverse hypoxemia by increasing FiO2. If the patient is showing signs of increased work of breathing, then we can uh, select a non-invasive ventilation strategy. Um, actually, non-invasive ventilation uh, strategies are quite questionable in this category of patients. Uh, there have been several reports talking about high failure rates, delayed intubation, and their negative effects on outcome. Um, they also recommending to measure or estimate the esophageal pressure and uh, to, uh, to monitor for excessive inspiratory efforts. The point here is to avoid high swings in negative intrathoracic pressure or to avoid high transpulmonary pressure uh, in order to avoid the complications that might be associated with this. So if we have a patient with large inspiratory esophageal pressure swings, then we need to intubate and sedate that patient in order to avoid ventilator-induced lung injury or even patient self-inflicted lung injury. For those patients who are hypercapnic, they are suggesting to uh, use a tidal volume that is greater than 6 mL per kg of ideal body weight. Uh, we can go up to 8 or even 9 mL per kg of ideal body weight. Since the respiratory system compliance is nearly normal in those patients, so they can tolerate well this increased uh, tidal volume. They also are recommending to use prone positioning only as a rescue therapy and to limit the PEEP to 8 up to 10. Um, they also recommending um, not to go so fast for the weaning process. Uh, the disease process might take a few weeks, so we need to let the disease process to resolve first, and then we can wean those patients. Um, at the end of, those, uh, of, of their report, um, they mentioned, and I'm quoting here, um, understanding the correct pathophysiology is crucial to establishing the, the basis for appropriate treatment. Taking this into consideration, I will be pleased to take you in a very simplified and quick journey uh, to the pathophysiology of uh, COVID-19 induced ARDS. So far, we have four uh, major families of coronaviruses that have been discovered up to now, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. The first two um, has been proven to be transmitted to humans. The one that we are talking about nowadays, the novel coronavirus, is believed to come from bats then transmitted to humans, and then human-to-human -human transmission. So when the virus gets inside our bodies, it gets attached to angiotensin-converting enzyme type 2 receptors, which gives the virus the access to inside the host cell, inside which the virus uncoats itself to allow for its genetic material to be uh, translated into viral particles that gets assembled in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus, after which the virus continues its way to outside of the host cell in order to continue infecting other cells and um, maybe even the same cell. Now, this mechanism overwhelms the normal processing of the host cell, which results into an injury to that cell. In addition, um, this mechanism also results into down-regulation of antigenes and converting enzyme type 2 receptors, but, uh, so we lose the effect, the protective effect of the uh, angiotensin and converting enzyme type 2 receptors. In order to understand the important role of angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 in the development of ARDS, we need first to understand the normal physiology of renin angiotensin system. So basically, renin angiotensin system plays a major role in controlling our blood pressure. It has other functions, but this is the major one. So we have this renin, which is a hormone that gets secreted by our kidneys by a special type of cells called the juxtaglomerular cells. Um, since it's a hormone, it gets secreted to the bloodstream directly, through which it goes to the liver. Inside the liver, it enhances the transformation of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Um, angiotensin 1 goes through the bloodstream to our lungs, inside which we have angiotensin converting enzyme type 1 and type 2. So, um, um, the major effect of angiotensin converting enzyme type 1 is to transform angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. The net effect of angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 is to transform angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1.7. The effects of angiotensin 1-7 are the exact opposite of the effects of angiotensin 2. Um, so it, it is a, a, a counter-regulatory mechanism that keeps the effects of angiotensin 2 under control. So the question is, 
what would be the result if the angiotensin if the angiotensin 2 goes out of control um, so if we have this excessive amount of angiotensin 2 uh, that gets um, uh, attached to angiotensin type 1 receptor this might result in uh, oxidative stress inflammatory processes uh, low production of nitric oxide um, several vascular diseases remodeling of the cells atherosclerosis and uh, the development of hypertension as well um, those effects together that might result in several cardiovascular events including heart failure infarctions uh, stroke um, it also plays a, a role in the development of uh, some metabolic diseases including diabetes mellitus um, it also might play a role in the development of renal failure as well. Now, we need to keep in mind that all of those negative effects are um, might result if the uh, amount of angiotensin 2 is more than the normal or the effects of angiotensin 2 goes out of control. On this diagram, we have a list of the major effects of uh, angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 1-7. So, angiotensin 2 exerts its effects mainly through attachment to angiotensin type 1 receptor and this attachment process might result into um, uh, vasoconstriction, sodium and water retention, inflammatory response, uh, hypertrophy, hyperplegia and cellular proliferation including also um, oxidative stress. If we look at angiotensin 1-7 its effects mainly um, are due to uh, the attachment to angiotensin type 2 receptor um, and if we look at the effects of this attachment process, they are almost the exact opposite of the effects of angiotensin 2. So in case of um, uh, acute lung injury, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme type 1, uh, angiotensin 2, um, they play um, a lung pro injury promoting factors, while the angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 uh, are protecting from lung injury. Going back to the case of coronavirus infection, we have mentioned that the coronavirus should be attached to angiotensin-converting enzyme type 2 in order to have an access to inside of the host cell. This attachment process might result into angiotensin-converting enzyme type 2 downregulation, in addition to the other negative effects, including the replication process of the virus that overwhelms the normal processing of the host cell, which might result into an injury to that cell. Now, the fact that the angiotensin-converting enzyme type 2 receptor downregulation occurs, this will result into losing the counter-regulatory mechanism that keeps the effects of angiotensin 2 under control. And the net effect of having angiotensin 2 uh, effects out of control, um, this might result into a severe lung injury and acute lung failure. This might occur in the early stages of the disease. However, in the later stages of the disease, this whole host cell might get destroyed by all of those processes. Um, so we are going to lose our angiotensin 2 and uh, its uh, counter-regulatory mechanism as well. This might result in what we call a vasoplegia, which might be um, a potential mechanism that explains why those patients with type L are having such a well-aerated lung at the same time, um, they are having um, this right to left shunt and um, a low ventilation to perifusion ratio as well. Um, in fact, um, this, this, uh, this mechanism also has been proposed by Dr. Gattanoni and his colleagues as well. This table compares the biological features of the coronavirus infection that was emerged in 2002 and the novel coronavirus that we are having nowadays. If you look at the signs and symptoms that might result due to uh, both infections, they share quite similar signs and symptoms, which suggests that the tissues that are affected by both infections might be the same tissues. In fact, what I'm interested in the most is this line, which is the interreceptor to humans, uh, which is, as we mentioned before, the angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 receptor. Now, those receptors are mostly abundant in uh, type 1 and type 2 alveolar epithelial cells, um, the enterocytes of all parts of small intestine, the arterial and venous endothelial cells, and if you look at the distribution of those cells, they are mostly part of the uh, pulmonary, cardiovascular, renal, and gastrointestinal system. So the signs and symptoms um, that we should expect should be related to those tissues. Um, there is nothing appealing here. Um, any cell that has the angiotensin-converting enzyme type 2 receptor is at risk to be affected by this infection.
Um, however, the, the extent to which the tissues will be affected or the severity of signs and symptoms might depend on the variations in the expression levels of angiotensin converting enzyme type 2. In order to have a closer look on the aforementioned facts, I have reviewed several histopathological studies that have been done on uh, tissues of patients with confirmed COVID-19. The vast majority of those studies reported a diffuse alveolar damage and pneumocyte hyperplasia, proliferation, desquamation, and metaplasia. And in fact, all of those processes are promoted by the effects of angiotensin 2. There was also an intra-alveolar fibrinous exudates and extensive pulmonary interstitial fibrosis along with hyaline membrane formation. And again, angiotensin 2 also promotes the development of inflammatory processes that might end with fibrosis. Um, there was also studies that reported pulmonary hemorrhagic infarcts and hemorrhagic necrosis existed predominantly in the outer edge of the lung loops. Uh, which is in line with what we have seen on the CT scan. The disease process starts from the periphery and then spreads to inside of the lungs. Um, there was also studies that reported a small vessels that showed uh, severe congestion, vessel wall thickening, lumen stenosis, occlusion, and microthrombosis formation, which might explain uh, why those patients with type L phenotype, uh, they have such a low ventilation to perifusion ratio. Um, there was also uh, an interesting finding um, uh, which was reported by the last study on the list. Um, that is, there was a direct kidney parenchymal infection and likely secondary endothelial injury. This means that the virus might infect other tissues than the lung tissue. So, as we mentioned before, any tissue that has the angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 receptor is at risk to be affected directly by the virus. As we mentioned repeatedly, this disease process also has a cardiovascular involvement. The potential mechanisms for this cardiovascular involvement might be the imbalance of renin-angiotensin system, as we mentioned before. It might be due to the inflammatory storm. Actually, some of the uh, histopathological studies reported the presence of uh, several types of inflammatory mediators um, um, along with envagen by inflammatory cells as well. Um, in addition, hypoxemia and stress response might play a, a role in the development of cardiovascular injury. In fact, I have noticed something interesting in the statistics that have been done on patients who had uh, cardiovascular injury. This table shows the baseline characteristics of a cohort of 416 patients with confirmed COVID-19, and it compares the data for those who had cardiac injury to those who did not. So there was a significant proportion of those who had hypertension at baseline, they developed a cardiac injury throughout the course of the disease. And similar results has been reported for those who had diabetes and coronary heart disease. More interestingly, um, those patients who had multiple mottling and ground glass opacity at baseline, almost two-thirds out of those patients developed a cardiac injury. This means that if we have a patient um, who has all of those comorbidities along with this radiological findings, um, we need to keep in mind that this patient is at increased risk for cardiac injury and we need to evaluate them for that. More interestingly, when you look at the, at the complications and the outcomes of those patients and compare the data for those who had cardiac injury to those who did not, those who had cardiac injury tend to have a higher rate of complications, including ARDS. And more importantly, when you look at the outcomes, uh, more than half of those patients who had cardiac injury unfortunately passed away versus 4.5% out of those who did not. So to summarize, we need to correctly phenotype those patients in order to uh, select the best ventilation strategy that suits their situation. And we need to closely monitor their cardiopulmonary function, and especially those who are at increased risk for development of uh, cardiac injury. And um, we need to risk stratify them in order to avoid the complications. And we should keep in mind that individualized patient care is crucial to save their lives. Thank you for watching this video and be safe.